It's so funny. When I started, I missed the whole comedy boom in the U.S. anyway. And someone said to me, boy, I would hate to be starting out and stand up now. Well, I made a great living at it. But now I look at that and go, boy, I'd hate to start out and stand up now. But people are making a great living at it. You got it? Be you. People pay for you. Put your spin on it. Be professional. And those three things alone will separate you out. Well, hi there, and welcome to Side Hustle Hero, the show that is laser focused to inspire you to take action to start or to scale your side hustle income streams. I'm your host, Joan Posse, author of The Way Success Works. Jan McGinnis makes a very good living at being, well, funny. While Jan started her side hustle as a stand up comic, over the years, she's expanded her offerings to include being a comedy writer, selling material to everything from the Tonight Show monologues and hundreds of radio stations to greeting cards and syndicated cartoon strips. She also does a lot of corporate work and keynote presentations. In today's episode, Jan describes a lot of different ways to make money being funny, as well as where to find these gigs, how to make yourself memorable, and what advice she would give young Jan if she were starting over today. But before that, I have a favor to ask. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment and leave a five-star review at the platform where you're listening to let others know that there's valuable content here to help them start or grow their side hustle. Thank you so much. Now here is my conversation with the multi-talented funny lady, Jan McInnes. Welcome, Jan. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I can't think of a more fun person to have on the show than a comedian, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you jumped into the industry as a side hustle. How did that come about? Well, I always wanted to be a comedian. It was kind of in the back of your head, you know, but I didn't know how. Nobody in my family is entertaining, uh, at least uh, professionally. Okay. <laughs> and so I went on to college, did the whole college route. I remember the night I graduated from college, having the dinner with my parents and family and thinking... Now is not the time to tell them I want to be a comedian. <laughs> There's probably never a good time. <laughs> no, but especially not after they just paid the last bill. So right. I, I went into marketing for probably a dozen years or so. And unbeknownst to me, it was a good kind of um, beginning because when I got into comedy, my marketing materials were better than my act. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but thankfully, my act caught up. And I ended up, uh, you know, you, you try it a little bit, though. They have the open mics. And I tried it once and in the 80s, and I did great. But I was so freaked out by the lights because you, you really can't see anything, okay? Right. And I remember leaving that night, and this, the professional comedian grabbed my hand on the steps outside the comedy club and said, please promise me you will do this again. I was so freaked out, waited eight years, missed the whole boom. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we did uh, tried the Jay Leno Comedy Challenge, which was a big thing they were doing in the U.S. I'm not sure if they did it up in Canada. A lot of comedians got their start with that, where he was trying to find an unknown comedian. So a lot of comedy clubs around the area were running these challenges. Kind of like America's Got Talent, only for comedy. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I literally didn't know anything about it, what to do, but I... Borrowed my dad's mini cassette recorder. <laughs> I didn't know people were professional comedians sending these in, you know, from comedy clubs. And I wrote some jokes and walked around my condo and recorded them. <laughs> okay. Sent them in and they called one of the clubs. The news station called and doing three clubs. I was in the D.C. area at the time. Okay. They had one in Virginia, one D.C., one in Maryland. And they said, uh, we liked your jokes. We want to put you on. And I, I remember saying, how many people you know, submitted because <laughs> they only two because, you know, they got, and no, they had hundreds of people submitted. They put me on the Virginia show. I was freaked out because I was the only non-professional oh, and wow. I'd never done this before. I'd done a few little things and, and it went great. I didn't win, obviously, but I did, I, my whole goal was not to be the worst. <laughs> and I wasn't, you know, I know, sometimes we go for the bottom thing, you know. So it wasn't, I ended up getting some of my jokes put in the newspaper. Nobody read them because my mom bought up all the copies. But I, <laughs> I'm sure I still, she did. <laughs> yeah, I was so excited. Uh, I didn't even know it. I went in the next day and my friend said, uh, in my cubicle next to me, she said, well, you got in the news. I said, what? And so I, I was excited. I still waited another year. Finally said, all right, this is it. I'm going to go to one last open mic. I'm going to get this out of my system. I'm not a comedian. I'm a marketing person. Went to the open mic and um, I did my set. I got on stage. You're supposed to do five minutes. I did three. The lights were still blinding. I had practiced with lights in my eyes, but still blinding. 
but people were laughing, just really laughing. And I thought, I forgot the rest of my act, get off stage, they're laughing. So I got <laughs> off stage and then I get this tap on my shoulder and it's the um, MC and he goes, call Pat tomorrow. And I said, Who, who's Pat? And he goes, right. she books this place. She caught your act, she wants to give you some work. And I felt the epiphany. I thought, this is it, I'm wow. gonna do this. I'm gonna do this, hopefully full time, but at least I'm gonna do it more. It really was an epiphany, it was fun. Yeah, you caught the bug that night. I did. So many starts and stops, but I don't care where you start and stop, you know, how many times you start and stop, if you really want to do it, yeah, it'll work out. So then at this point, you're doing it part-time then, fitting it day in job with your marketing day, work. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And when did things really turn around for you? You know, you always think you're going to leave, you're going to go for like the first month I remember writing down, I'm going to be on full time in about two weeks, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm that good. <laughs> uh, no, it was about two and a half years. I, I wanted, really wanted to leave and you just, you know, when it's right. About two and a half years in, I had kind of a big blow up with the upper management. I walked mm. away thinking I can't do this anymore. i had been working a lot of clubs and so I called in sick the next day and wrote my six month game plan and decided I'm going to leave in six months. I learned a term called throwing your hat over the fence where you have to go over and get it. What do you do that makes you do that? So what I did was I, in six months from then, I booked two weeks in a comedy club and I knew my boss wasn't going to give me two weeks off. Uh, and I knew if I canceled the comedy club, they would never book me again. And comedy was such my passion. I thought I have to do it. So I made me leave. Right. Then I did. I, yeah. I followed the plan. Yeah. Awesome. You wanted to keep that commitment to yourself as well. Yes. You, you make a commitment to yourself or others and you can make book on it. It's going to happen. It, it is. And it makes you really released a lot of pressure at work because I just, in the back of my head, anytime something people were, you know, things weren't going right, I thought, hmm, doesn't matter. <laughs> I right. still yeah. did my work, but I had a different uh, mindset and framed it differently. And it, it was really uh, refreshing and releasing. Thinking back over the years, what's been one of your most memorable or special gigs? Oh, gosh, I've had so many. I bet. There's been, the gigs where my knees are shaking. There's the gigs where they're huge that I rocked. One was interesting, I have to say, it was when I was making a transition from comedy clubs to corporate. I wanted to get in the corporate arena. I wanted, but, you know, I was, and I got my first kind of big non-comedy club gig. It was about 1,500 people. Nice. I'd never been in front of that group. That, And a friend of mine had really pushed to get me into this. It was at the Grove Park Inn. 1,500 people, really major. And my friend had kind of pushed me on the show. He kind of talked to the guy booking it, really, you know, you have to have Jen, you have to have Jen. So I was really nervous. And the guy booking it wasn't happy that I was there. He really didn't want me there. 1,500 mm -hmm. people, and they're all pretty drunk. I was just going to ask you what the time slot was that when you it wasn't after yeah, dinner, was it? Yeah, it was nighttime, and, oh, I, and I, my friend Frank King was with was on the show as well. And Frank was all watch me to give me some corporate work because he was very into doing corporate. So I had a lot of pressure right before I'm going out. Guy who running the whole show who didn't want me on it taps my shoulder. They're literally calling my name, and he goes, "Women never do well at this event." Oh wow! Trying to sabotage me, and I really? walk out. My knees are shaking. What an ass. And I just lit into it and went into one of the best shows and rocked. I mean, <laughs> rocked. And I I walked off the stage and it was an epiphany. It was like, yeah. you, you know. You I, walked off the stage, look at them, and you're like, they do now. <laughs> yeah. And they exploded. The room exploded. It was it was great. He never booked me again. He was not a nice human being to me. But... <laughs> But I walked that night. I felt um, we went to the VIP party we had to go to afterwards, and I walked in the room and people just like a, parted like the Red Sea, and touching me and like, "Hey, Jan, you're doing really slapping me on the back." And it was so fun, and it was just yeah. one of the most memorable times. And uh, you know, you just feel, oh, this is what it's like to really do well despite all the things after. And then I got into some corporate work. Frank was great, helped me out, and got me into some corporate stuff. And moved on to there. So that was the one of the most memorable. Nice. And uh, just a side note there too, those before and after events, gatherings are really valuable or can be very valuable for contacts and referrals yeah. and yeah. In your ego, in your yeah. brain, just making it, yourself solidifying how you feel about your yourself, you know. Yeah. And getting testimonials too, because you just yeah. killed it. They're in the room. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, it's yeah. funny about testimonials. I, uh, when I was trying to make this transition also into corporate, 
I knew I needed those because all I had was a lot of comedy clubs. And I, through a fluke of making phone calls, I talked to a guy who ran corporate events in Iowa, Keith West. He would bring me out. He said, all right, uh, are you clean? I said, yeah, he is great. I've got a lot of Christmas parties, which were corporate dish events. And I said, okay. I said, I don't care what, he would bring me out for two weeks. He said, and l- line me up with a bunch of these parties. I said, I don't care what I make, how much money it is, but I want, if they like the show, they must give me a testimonial. Nice. I need this from these companies. And yep. that really, again, helped another avenue to help launch me. Yeah. Um, and most people will it. give you that testimonial if you ask, but usually you got, you got to ask. You've got to ask. Yeah, you've got to ask. And now I have my assistant do it just because it's easier for her to go after people over. She does all yeah. the, the admin stuff. Yeah, you have to ask. You have to get people to, people really do want to. And and attendees want to. I'll send, a, I'll get attendees saying how great they enjoyed the keynote is. Now I'm doing a lot of keynotes. And I'll say, hey, can I use that in my marketing? Oh my gosh, yes. We want to help you. People want to help you. They really do. Yeah. But you do have to ask. You know, you yes. can't just hope that they'll come to you because people are busy and they don't think about it. Right. Or in, if they have not been in that self-employed space, they may not recognize the value of it yeah, they or the don't. necessity, yeah. really. When someone says comedian, I think a stand-up comic, but it yep. sounds like there are a lot of different potential income streams to get paid for, well, to get paid for being funny. You've mentioned uh, <laughs> corporate. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And it's funny because people will be like, really, you're a comedian for 20-something years and we haven't heard of you? Well, no, but you know, you work at... There's so many other things. So, so what are some of the best opportunities that you see today out there or that oh, you're involved in? I'll tell you in, what, how I did it. I kind of always had my eye on um, on corporate. I When I still had my marketing job, I remember hiring the Capital Steps for a corporate um, dinner. The Capital Steps are a comedy troupe that runs around. Uh, probably they just disbanded um, a year or two ago. But they're very funny. They're made up of Capitol Hill staffers on Washington, D.C. And they got very, very famous. And they did song parodies. And I remember I hired them for this event. And I stood there thinking, well, I, I wonder... You know, if other events would use comedians, you've got to keep your eyes open. I would tell you, if you're looking, if you're doing a side hustle, keep your eyes open for other opportunities because corporate never crossed my mind. You think of stand up comedy. So I would ask my comedian friends, hey, what about corporate events? And they'd say, no, there's just Christmas parties. And I kept, no, I really think there's something else. So I kept yeah. that in the back of my head and eventually found the avenue into, into corporate, into moving into corporate. And then, I'm now doing a lot more humor keynotes. Conventions, uh, when it came out in 2008 or so, I don't know, many moons ago, people wanted comedy, but they wanted a message. And I didn't even know what a keynote speaker was. (laughs) But I kept my eyes open again, and I moved into doing humor keynotes and talking to people and showing them what things comedians know and learn and how they can work in their business. So... Isn't that kind of what you did way back when with that fifteen hundred dollar, or excuse me, fifteen hundred person venue? Or that was that was straight comedy, format. but it was moving oh, into okay. the corporate arena. Yeah, you know, I didn't know I was a good comedy writer, but a friend of mine happened to be writing for a radio prep service where they sell jokes and things to radios around radio stations around the country. And he introduced me to this, and I started writing jokes, and I I was good at it. I was good at jokes in my act. I was good at jokes. So I found out, oh, I can write joke so and that then i started writing for other people i've written sold material to everyone from uh, jay leno for the tonight show to wart removal cream companies <laughs> I mean, i've done a lot but i just started so I, I would really say when you're doing you have this vision when you start out this is where i'm going but i'm glad i'm doing now keynotes in corporate because i i'm tired of working nights and weekends i don't want to be working nights and weekends all you know at the beginning it was fun so but now it's even more fun to be doing something at breakfast or lunch. So I would say keep your eyes open and really listen. And what are other people doing? And even if people say, nah, that's not a thing in this business, it might be a thing. You got to keep pursuing it. Yeah. Well, your colleagues early on said that corporate wasn't a thing other than the Christmas parties. What type of right. other yeah. things that you did you find work in in regards to corporate? Oh, uh, you know, companies, um, association conventions, conferences. I just did a program this week in Chicago for, you know, 50 people that they wanted to talk about using humor in their business. I've been brought in to work with PR firms that say, how do you use humor? And so I go in and talk with them. So anything from 5,000 to 25 people, you know, I do these events and they bring me in to talk about using humor and in business and, you know, because humor is a great way to get people to listen to you, get people to remember you, that sort of thing. Yeah. And for those side hustle people out there who have a corporate company background, you've got that expertise going into it. 
in terms right. of, you know, just the dynamics of being in a company. Yeah. And, and use everything you have. Like in yeah. comedy, since I had my marketing background, I was good at marketing myself, but I was also very professional. I had many clubs say, we love working with you because you show up at the time you say, well, you do the amount of time you say, you don't drop in unexpectedly and want to get on stage. You don't drink up the bar, you know, when we're, you, yeah. you're very professional. And so I use that background to help with the comedy. And, and I, that's one way I stood out because mm -hmm. I was easy to work with and professional to work with. I think that is so key. And people underestimate that sometimes. Oh, I had an improv do. person on a long time ago on the show. And he said the best piece of advice that he gives his students when he's teaching this kind of stuff. He said, don't be a dick. People will yeah. not w work with you, want to hire you. He says, I'm not kidding. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I'm not kidding. It's, they may have to hire you if you bring in put butts in seats, as they call it, and they mm -hmm. bring in a crowd, they may be forced to, but they will not like it. And the minute they don't have to work with you, they won't. So keep your reputation intact as far as, you know, being professional, being easy to work with, and um, and people be the person that, that you want to work with, you know? I mean, yeah. you don't want to be a, be a jerk either. <laughs> so you started out strictly comedy and comedy clubs, but now yeah. it sounds like there's very much a teaching component to what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's business advice from a from a comedian. How to connect with people in your organization, how to diffuse tension, how to, you know, I go in and talk about, I give examples from comedy. You know, we go into situations where it's maybe not conducive to comedy. I mean, I've been brought into situations, you know, where they read off the, I don't know, they gave out 289 awards. People walk to the stage, get their word, walk back, their service pin for years of service. And then they send me out about midnight. I whoa, can't just whoa, whoa, go into whoa. my act. They did 289, 289 of these uh, people? 289 service bids, yeah. That must have taken forever. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. We sat there marking names off at the table. You know, then I have to go up and perform. Well, I can't just go up into and go into my act because people are tired. So you have to kick off with something to kind of break the ice, diffuse the tension. So I got up and I said, hey, I think I got my five-year pin just sitting here because it was giving that horse. <laughs> And so I talk about in business, if you sit down at a staff meeting and you've just had some big change, some big thing, and you're not going to address it, well, guess what? Everyone's still thinking about it. You got to address it. You can use a little bit of humor. You're not trying to be a comedian, but use a little bit of humor to address it. So I talk in terms of that, and people love it because people think of comedians. They don't think of all the techniques and the things we use on stage to command the audience, to get people to listen and get people and to deal with the hecklers. They don't think about that and, until they've got a comedian saying, hey, I can teach you something in business. You know? There's a massive skill set there. So many oh. things as you've been talking, I've had flashbacks to all the <laughs> presentations I've done worldwide and just things that you pick up along the way. Like if there's a humming sound in the background, don't worry about it because if it's constant and it's low enough, people just get used to it. But if right. it's like something loud and intrusive, you got to address it. And you know, yeah. like just all these things that you learn along the way. Yeah. Most of the people can't hear it. Like in the comedy clubs, if there's somebody in the front row saying stuff to you, but where's the crowd can't hear it. You don't address it because if you're going to go mm -hmm. ballistic on this person in the front row, people are like, what is wrong with her? Yeah. You know, they don't know yeah. what's happening. So things like that, you want to know how to deal with a heckler. I learned that. I didn't get heckled a lot, but don't go after the heckler because you, sorry, it's usually a guy, go after the girlfriend or the wife he's with. They want right. him to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> don't go around the person. <laughs> So, you know, you learn some techniques, but you can use them in business. You know, if you're, if you're having a problem with someone, you don't go right at them head on head. Mm -hmm. you find a way around it to work around it. Yeah, absolutely. Bring a bottle of water on stage because if you lose your train of thought, you get a chance to drink. A I'm, never, I'm never thirsty on stage, but I'll pick up the water <laughs> thing. Okay, it gives me five seconds. <laughs> Where am I going with this? <laughs> uh, well, the um, odd time, too, I've asked the audience. You know, somebody in the audience. Now, where were we again? But there yeah. was this uh, uh, one time where I can't remember what happened, but I said something and I stopped for a moment and like there's, you couldn't hear a pin drop, which was wonderful. But right at that moment, somebody's cell phone rang <laughs> and she answers it and she, you could hear, like everybody heard her say, I can't talk right now. Well, we just all laughed. I mean, it was just hilarious. And that was definitely a time where I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I had a funny cell phone years ago. Gosh, I was doing a um, Christmas party for a group and it was um, truck drivers, which I was not really my audience. I don't know much about trucking. I always okay. interview the client stuff, but it was trying to find the think of a way to connect. Well, I got to the event. It was in a church basement and, and no 
bar, no boot. I thought, these are truck drivers. They want a beer, right? You know? Yeah. So before the, this is an odd thing, but before the, uh, before I went on, they got in a circle and they did a prayer. And in that prayer, someone's cell phone went off. And so, after, so when I got on stage, I found my perfect opening line. I said, you know, we had a prayer and someone's cell phone went off. I think it's Jesus asking where the beer is. Place went up because <laughs> <laughs> it was an instant connection. And yeah. I knew that, you know, that was my first thought when I walked out. Where's the where's the bar for these guys, you know? And so after that, I could do no wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you won them over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a little bit of humor. Well, I know that you feel that people can make a great living at it today, but there's got to be a lot of competition out there. There is, but you can't think about that. Okay. Boy, if you focus on the competition, it's so funny. When I started, I missed the whole comedy boom uh, in the U.S. anyway. It was in the 80s, I believe, in the 90s. Missed the whole comedy boom. And someone said to me, boy, I would hate to be starting out and stand up now. Well, I made a great living at it. And now I look at that and go, boy, I'd hate to start out and stand up now. But people are making a great living at it. You got to be you. People pay for you. Put your spin on it. Be professional. Right. And those three things alone will separate you out. Good communication, showing up on yeah. time, showing up early, actually. Being there, not canceling. Right, right. Yeah, so I wouldn't pay attention too much and worry too much about whatever market you're in and what you're trying to do. You know, how many diet products are out there? How many exercise <laughs> products are out there? How, and it's filled, yeah. it's way more filled than with comedians. What you're going to do, and, and this happens in, um, when I came out, moved out to LA, in commercials, they said, you know, they'll bring in 50 people who look like the same person, blonde hair, blue eyes, that they want in this commercial. They're casting mm. this type. Yes. So they start to eliminate you. You know, okay, oh, he did a commercial uh, with alka uh, some diarrhea product. We don't want him in our commercial because <laughs> we don't want to associate with that product. So they start eliminating. And that's kind of what happens in, in other businesses too. When they have equal, they start to eliminate you. Mm -hmm. Can work good or bad in my favor. Sometimes I've had events where we didn't want a woman comic. So I get eliminated. I had an event one time. It was a four a series of four events for a major corporation around the country. And they chose a different comedian. But the first event he couldn't do. And so I was their second choice. They brought me in. I did great. I mean, just rocked. And afterwards, they said, we're canceling that comedian. We're bringing you in for these three. And I said, no, 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 no. That, no, no, you can't. And he, they said, no, you were actually our first choice. We didn't go with you because you were a woman. And this was a mostly male organization. We are afraid to bring a woman in. I said, but I still can't do that to the other comedian. That's not fair. They said, no, the CEO has told us <laughs> you are the one. And so I felt wow. terrible. They said, we will book him next year. But I was eliminated at first because I was a woman. Well, you know, I'm, that, I'm actually surprised they admitted that to you. Oh, my. If I could say stuff like that, I'm telling you, I've been told we're not booked. I've been told to my face, we're not booking you because you're a woman. Yeah. Now, if I had wanted to bring some lawsuits, I guess I could have. And, mm. you know, that was many years ago. But, what does that, all you have to yeah, do is exactly. just keep proving yourself. They can't do yeah. it now. They can't say that. But they will look for ways to eliminate, you know, we don't like your look. We don't like, I don't know. Right. We've got we've got two white guys on the show. We don't want two white guys. We need a, some, a different mix, you know. So they, they try to find ways to eliminate that way. So do everything you can to control the things that they'll eliminate you for. So what doors do you think you need to knock on virtually or in, in person? Like, how do you find gigs? We find my assistant does a lot of the marketing. Now I started with um, phone calling. <laughs> we started calling media planners and just said, uh, how do I tell you about me? Yeah. And you find that you go on the internet is so much easier. LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. I've gotten some events off of that. Just have a big presence out there. Have, be ready with good information and, and show. For me, people want to see that I've done this again. A media planner wants to see that I've I've done keynotes, I've done comedy successfully. Uh, they want to see that, you know, find out what the person wants to see. In comedy clubs, they want to see a 45 minute tape. If they want to book you for the headlining spot, they want to know you have 45 killer minutes. Okay. Not so much in the corporate, they they want to see a short tape, but they want to see that other people have booked you. They're not the first. Yes. So find out whatever industry it is, find out how, what are their requirements for uh, what makes them feel comfortable. What do you think of the idea of doing some gigs initially for free in exchange for a testimonial? I think if you're starting out, you have to. You kind of have to do that. Um, you have to do something that showcases yourself. When I started out, I didn't have a very good video videotape or that people could look at. Yes. I didn't. So I had what I did was I, 
I would lived in the East Coast at the time, around the DC area. I booked a gig far away, like as I were something. It was about two thousand miles away. Yeah, it wasn't much money, but what I did was set up auditions on the way out and back. So mm-hmm. the money I made at that gig paid for my gas. Right, and I had to do it in person until I got a good tape that they could see. So right. I had uh, no, I did a lot of auditions that was that were free. One very memorable, nice one. I got there and um, it was in uh, Ohio. The feature act, which is the person who does thirty minutes in the in the D, in the um, uh, U.S. The comedy clubs are a little different in Canada, I believe. But the person has to do thirty minutes. Well, that feature didn't show, and I was supposed to do a ten minute guess, a ten minute audition. Mm-hmm. So the club owner said, "Well, would you do the thirty? And I said, "Yeah, I'm here," and I did it. And she paid me, and I said, "We don't have to pay me. This is an audition." She goes, "No, you did the you did more than we were supposed to," which was great, really nice of her. And you were prepared. You were able to do that. You were able to deliver. I was ready because that's the slot I was going for. So I was able to really show her that I had the 30 minutes. And even if I didn't, what was she going to do? Dance around for 30 minutes? (laughs) Right. (laughs) She needed a comedian. So even if I was terrible, she wouldn't have to book me again. (laughs) But I I ended up being uh, doing well. As I've done this for many years, people say, oh, do this for free or do this really cheap and you'll get exposure. No. Yeah, no. (laughs) I've already gotten exposure. I'm already uh, exposed. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to do it. It's, you know, I don't, and I, you know, I don't think people value if you've been doing this a long time. And now if it's a charity thing and it's a get real, you know, near to my heart, certainly uh, right. I'd be happy to, but yes, you know, someone out of the blue saying, well, we're nonprofit. We don't have a budget, but then they have hosted at this resort that's $500 a night. It's right. like, you know, you can afford to bring yeah. your people and you can afford to bring Exactly. Yeah. So. There's a um, nonprofit organization that I've been doing an annual gig for them for the last 27 years. It's yeah. near and dear to my heart. I will continue to do it. Yeah. Sure. And I say also, you know, if they don't have a big budget or they- They don't. You no. can throw, toss in a few things extra too if you're, if their budget is a little slim. You know, I could say, look, I can MC for you too. If you really want to bring me in for the keynote, pay my fee, I could do some MC work for you or do some, you know, do something else or do, I don't know, book signing or give you 50 bucks or whatever to give right. out it. You know, things like that to kind of help with the fee. Yeah. And if somebody's starting out and the event that they're going to, they're going to be set up well with the uh, AV, maybe they could ask for a quality recording of- Yeah. Yeah. There's things you can bargain for, for sure. Is there a certain type of training or disciplines to study that you would recommend? For comedy or for entrepreneur in general? Comedy, comedy writing- well, you can certainly uh, read books, you can practice, you can take classes, but I'm telling you, until you're on stage at an open mic where you're not getting paid and nobody paid to see you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the way to do it. So when you were starting out, you have to just get up, you have to do it. I mean, I probably was on stage almost every night the first couple of years I went full time because uh-huh. I you have to do it, you get good or you get out. I mean, yeah. and you've got to get good fast if you want to get paid. So, and it's hard, it is a hard way to do it, but I don't know of any other way to to get yeah. better. And and that's probably with many professions, you just have to do it a lot. You can read books. And and I'd say if you're going to read books, or you're going to take a class, make sure the person teaching it or writing it has done it. Yes. I'm so sick of getting people, hey, take my master class and be a comedian. And this person has never done it, you know, or never done it for a living. Like they might have done it, but they haven't made a living out of it. And you are going to get duped and you're going to get theory. You're going to get, this is what you should do. Well, how about talk to someone who's done it, you yeah. know? Has done it and is doing it. Is doing it and is mm-hmm. successfully. And it doesn't have the day job to fall back on. Right. You know, it doesn't have a, a spouse, which which I think it worked in my favor not having a sec- another income when I started out because I know people who had a wife maybe or that were there who had a good income and they didn't have to work that hard. They didn't have to take these some of these crappy bar gigs that, yeah. and learn how to, how to handle that. They didn't have to, so they didn't move ahead mm-hmm. or as yeah. fast as they could. I had to... And I did a lot of crappy bar gigs and I hated them and I was terrible at some of them. And I had to move fast to get better and get out. I, yeah, it's like, I don't those. want to keep doing this anymore. Yeah. I need to get good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I I remember yeah. many, many horrible uh, comedy condos they would put you up in. And I would, instead of going golfing or going out during the day, I sat there and wrote because I thought the only way I'm going to get out of these crappy condos is if I write better jokes and I work hard. Yeah. And so I did. Yeah. And all those hours and days and weeks and months and years of experience uh, really stack up to the point where you get to a point, you're standing there on stage and it's, you know what, I can handle anything that comes now. Yes. Whatever it is, 
I'm here. It could be something yeah. new, but because you've dealt with so many things and put on so many miles, it's a really nice place to feel inside. Yeah. That whatever comes up, we'll just deal with it. As opposed to the first couple of years, it's like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I'm going to do. I had an agent hand me a check once and go, I wish I could make that for 45 minutes. And I said, oh, oh. And I took his head off with, I said, you yes. don't know the, the years of mm -hmm. touring the road and working hard and doing these hard gigs. Also, all these shows that come up like, um, I don't know, Last Comic Standing and shows, some of these people who've never done this before shoot to the top and also they have all the connections and everybody wants them, but they miss the hard gig. So the minute they get on stage and they have a problem, mm -hmm. they can't figure it out because they haven't had that happen to them. So right. really the hard knocks really help you deal with it and get to a point where I, whatever is going to happen. What are you going to do to me? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really, it really boosts the confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it fun because then you can play around with it and you can enjoy being on stage and not being frightened that something's not going to go right because, you know, you need it to go right because you don't know how not, it not to go right. Yeah. Well, what's the earning potential realistically now for someone new to the business? There's a wide range of what you can make. But, you know, I tell people, and I, I've coached a lot of people in moving into speaking, don't look at the money first. Don't look at the money because you can't get that, the good money. You can't get, you know, when you start out. Look at getting good to where they have to pay you and they want you and so they'll pay for you. Yeah. And that trajectory as far as how long that's going to take, it's really going to depend on the person. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Again, keep your eyes open because connections and the people you meet and the things, the avenues that you can go down to yeah. make, it'll change from person to person. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know, like I said, I didn't know what keynote speaker was <laughs> when I when I started comedy and, and you know, I even think comedy, go to comedy club. Okay, I'll do this. I remember one of my in-laws, one of my sister's in-laws asking me one night, I got to her house. It was late. I had a show the next day and I'd been traveling all day and I'm staying in their guest room. And she said, how long are you going to do this? And I remember thinking, I said, well, it's my job, I guess, forever. And that night I thought, well, I don't know, how long can I do this? <laughs> This is a lot hard, but you know, when we you know when you're excited about something and new, you're not looking at what you're leaving behind your job and everything. You're looking at what you're going to, and you got to focus on what you're going to. Not when you want to leave your job, don't look at the benefits and the thank goodness I didn't look at the benefits and the salary and the things I left sure. uh, and the future. I looked at this is what I want to do, and that excitement will carry you through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to move it, take your side hustle and make it into full time. A couple things that really did help me was, um that I should have done that I didn't do. Get the tools that you need for the what you want to move into. For me, it was I didn't get a good car, which I was driving fifty thousand miles a year. I ended up, you know, spending all my money on a car, on mm -hmm. car repair, because right. I didn't have a good car. So I didn't have the tools that I needed to really do the job. Yes. And also before I left my day job, I would say live the way you think you're gonna have to live. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're not gonna have all the money flowing in at first, you know? So I, I remember going, well, I'm probably not, I'm going to have cut down on my grocery budget. So I started shopping at a real discount grocery store that I didn't like shopping at, but it was cheaper than the nice store. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to get used to this because if, if I quit my day job and I start shopping at this grocery store and I hate it so much, I have to get another day job. I don't want grocery shopping to make me, you know, this lifestyle to make me go back to a day job. Right. So think of what are the things you're going to have to give up. If you've got a membership somewhere and you just love it, but you know you can't keep it going once you go full time, give it up now and get used to that feeling. And if you really can't live without it, then you know that's something you've got to take into consideration if you're going to go move into, take your side hustle full time. And I like to look at those things, like say, for example, the membership, not as something you're giving up, but more you're trading it. Trading. You're trading yeah. it for this opportunity to do something that you really love to do or want to give a, a really good shot. And that's not saying you have to so, give it up. So it feels like you're not de depriving yourself. Yeah. You're choosing something better. I have to tell you a fun story. About a week before I was leaving my job, I was at a Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California. Very swank, very nice hotel. And I knew I was going to be leaving in about a week. And it was the accommodations are going to be comedy condos and not great accommodations. Yeah. So my last night at the Fairmont, I got in the tub with a glass of wine and <laughs> just sat there and I thought, this is it. This is, you know, I'm really going to, the fall is going to be hard. And it was, it was very hard. The comedy condos are very, you know, they're just not great. 
All right, the common accommodate they are sometimes, but the accommodations a lot of times are not great. You're not in great hotels. What do you mean by a comedy club? A condo. Okay, a lot of times a comedy club will buy a condo and that's where the comics stay for the week. Oh, okay. um, in the condo. And it's cleaned usually by a waitress and the cleaning job usually usually screams, I don't want to be doing this on my Saturday. <laughs> you know? So I used to travel with a with a um, sleeping bag because I just want to sleep on top of the bed. I didn't want to touch anything. They aren't great. A lot of times you know, sometimes they are, but sometimes they but they're worn. Yeah, they've got a they churn of three comics every single week going through them, they're just worn down. Yeah. Uh, the hotels sometimes weren't great. You know, you're staying in not, not the Fairmont for sure. So I did this for a few years and finally I started getting back into the corporate. I got my first corporate booking. I was so excited and it was in Las Vegas and they sent me the name of the hotel and I thought, oh, I never heard of this, but I'm used to bad hotels. I'll be fine. Right. I get into the Vegas airport and they had a check-in place for this hotel at the airport. So I walk over to check in and I get up to the front and the check-in, the guy goes, have you heard of our hotel? It was a brand new one in Vegas. And I never, I can't think of the name of it now, but he said, uh, I said, no, I, I don't know what I'm getting into. And he looked at me square in the eye and he said, you're going to like this. It's just like the Fairmont. And I thought, I'm back. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> and it was. It was a great experience. So, um, oh, I yeah. Love so that. it does come full circle. The stuff, the, the things yeah. you give up, the memberships and stuff that you might have to put on, put on, think of putting on hold. If that's what you really want, that's part of your goal set right. to come back to that. And I wanted to get back to nice hotels. <laughs> and so you got in there, you did your corporate work, then you jumped in the bathtub with that, <laughs> with <laughs> with that glass of wine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thought, okay, it took a while, but... <laughs> yeah, it took a know. few years. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to sort of recap. So as far as those opportunities, you had mentioned comedy clubs, writing jokes, corporate work. Is there... Keynotes. Yeah. Uh, keynotes. How does a person get into writing for like a late night show? I would say uh, if you want to get into writing for others, writing for radio, right? Start haunting the comedy club. Start meeting the people that you want to write for. I mean, I did some mm. writing for um, speakers and such because I would sit, I would stay at the convention after I did my thing and I'd watch a speaker and I'd write a couple jokes for him. And I'd walk up afterwards and say, hey, you could add this to it. Boom. I got some lots of clients that way. Nice. So I would say start haunting the places you want to, the people you want to work for and see and give them a sample, show them what you can do and just, you know, you don't, don't stop waiting for permission. Right. Just go, go do it. Yeah. As a, go, keynote, as a keynote speaker, I would have loved that <laughs> for somebody to come up and say, here. Uh, a friend of mine who's now a friend is, uh, I did it for him and we became friends and he said, yeah, because when you gave me a couple of solid jokes, that's sort of like crack. It's like, oh. Oh, I want more of that. That was more really good. Yeah. You're really good. And, and you know, he hired me to punch up his speech. So nice. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have, but you have to go where the, where the, where it, yeah. the work is, you know, and if it's, you want to write for comedians, go hang out with comedians, go to comedy clubs. Yeah. Give me an idea if you would of, of what somebody charges or, or pays for something like that. Anywhere from 10 bucks to 200. I mean, for like a the, joke. Yeah. For a joke. Yeah. Uh, the hardest was to write for was greeting cards. They mm. were, you get um, 150, 200 bucks. But because the greeting cards, um, they were the hardest ones to write because they want specific yet general. They want Mother's Day card to be for a mother who has one kid or five kids, and the kids could be any age. Right. And so they want specific Mother's Day card, but general enough that it, you know, and so they were, very, and they want humor light. A lot of them, they don't want a funny, hard, you know, punchline. They want ha ha, little ha ha. So that I think that was the hardest thing for me to write for. And say you get a 150, 200 bucks maybe for a joke. And you think, oh, I could just write 10 jokes a week. But it's not that easy. <laughs> and yeah. they don't need them all. They need them in batches. They need them, you know, they'll hit you up and say, next week we need, send these in. So and you might sell one and you write 50. So, But that could be a great market niche for someone who loves a particular industry and they go to the conventions and they've got this, yeah. This ability to write jokes, to be able yeah. to, that would be a nice yeah. uh, side hustle gig. Yeah. Be an expert and, you know, really immerse yourself in the, the topic you want to write about. And and don't wait to be asked to, like for disc jockeys, you could just start sending a disc jockey the jokes and say, hey, they can always say, hey, stop it, you know, or, oh, these are good. Maybe we'll hire, you know. Hire. Yeah. Open those doors for yourself. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Awesome. I have a funny thing. I I said, don't uh, do something like, uh, I was on stage one night, you can't see anything, you know, and 
rocking, having a great set, and all of a sudden, boom, stop, quiet. And I thought, whoa, did I say something? What happened? Yeah. And I got off stage, and the uh, the meeting person came over and said, well, I guess I shouldn't have pushed in the six-foot-tall chocolate fondue fountain. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't no, have. I can't compete with chocolate. <laughs> Everyone stopped. It was staring at this thing, apparently. Uh, and, you know, so I say, don't be just, so don't uh, do that. And I have that in my little show setup sheet. This is this, because I, I know what works, you know? Yeah. Well, if you could go back in time, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? Like, what would you whisper in the ear of, to younger Jan? Don't worry. Don't I worried so much about you know staying afloat in stand up? I mean, getting the next gig. I'm having a bad show, and then it spirals into nobody's ever going to book me. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry about that stuff. Focus on what you're doing. Have fun. Have fun. Have fun. Literally enjoy the moment. And I I do try to stop it when I'm on the stage in front of it was 20 people or 5,000 people and think, wow, this is cool. You know, I'm getting to do this. And so enjoy the moment and really. Uh, Play it yourself and be present. What's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, Jan? You know, nobody can spell my last name, McGinnis. So uh, I go by, <laughs> uh, by I d used to do a lot of work humor when I was doing comedy clubs. So I go by theworklady.com. That's my website, theworklady.com. Okay. So great. Well, I'll make sure that that is in yeah, the Yeah, send me a note, Jan at theworklady.com. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your best tip to inspire others to start or grow their side hustle dream? Do something now. Don't look at the big picture, take a little piece of it and start doing something about it now. You know, even if it's just making a list of possible companies you could contact or something, you know, I had so many starts and stops, but at least I did something. I entered a contest. I took a class at an open to learn about comedy. So I would say just take a little piece and start baby steps. It is so scary to think long term and that I might leave this job. And so many people talk about that, leaving their job and going into stand up and they don't do it. Focus on you. And also my other thing would be, don't worry too much about the things that don't go right at first. You know, don't pay attention too much to that. Don't give it too much energy. I started with a woman who we both got together every Monday night and we ordered Hawaiian pizza, and which is the pineapple and ham and we talked about, we wrote jokes together. We talked about how we're going to quit our jobs and be comedians. And it was so much fun. And after about a year and a half, she kind of faded away. She stopped doing stand up. She moved away, gone out of it altogether. I ended up quitting my job and doing it. And years later, I ran into her at another state. And I said, we went out for a few drinks. And after a couple of glasses of wine, I said, why did you quit? What yeah. happened? And without missing a beat, she said, because I saw what happened to you. She saw all the hard gigs I did and she put them on herself and said, I don't want to go through that. And I said, yeah, but it's over. I mean, it's over. I got through it on the other side. I knew the other side is fantastic. And I don't have a job that I have to go to every, nine to five every day and I'm having fun. Yeah. But she couldn't get over that. She stared too much at the things that were going wrong and things. That, so don't do that. Pay attention to your own race and run your own race and have fun with it. Awesome. Great advice. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for sharing the journey of your life as a comedian for pointing us in the direction of opportunities in the industry today and of course for being today's side hustle hero thank you when i asked jan about all the competition out there today her advice was don't be too bothered by it instead focus on what you can do she said differentiate yourself by doing these three things and this is good advice for any industry we're in be you Put your spin on it and be professional. And don't underestimate the power of that last one, being professional. Make it easy for people to work with you and build a reputation as someone who can be counted upon. That's worth gold. It's doing things like showing up on time or a few minutes early. It's timely correspondence and following through on your commitments. And it doesn't matter if you're getting paid a million bucks or you're doing it for free. Be sure to do what you say you're going to do. I just finished reading an autobiography by Tina Turner, and she said it didn't matter if there was only 50 people or less in the audience, which was the case at times in the earlier days, or an audience of 50,000. She said it didn't matter. She put on the best show that she was capable, and any top keynote speaker or performer I've read about or talked to has said the same thing. 
So give it your best regardless. My mentor, Bob Proctor, used to say that a pro is at their best always. Regardless of circumstances, regardless of how you feel in the moment, you give your best. You act like the pro that you are. Well, that's a wrap for today. You'll find links to Jan's website and socials at our website, sidehustlehero.com. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know you're listening and tell me how this podcast is helping you and what areas could we do better. You can tag me or send a DM on Instagram at Joan Possivy. Thanks for listening and hustle on.